morning. I'm very happy to be here this morning. This semester, I'm walking through the book of Philippians with my students, so it only seems natural that that's where my sermon's going to be from this morning. So if you want to start opening your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, we will get there in just a minute. Way back when I was in high school and we studied the book of Philippians with uh, the youth group in our church, I learned that the book of Philippians is a book about joy. So maybe it's appropriate this morning that we ask ourselves, where do we find joy in life? In verse 4 of chapter 1, Paul says we find joy in partnership in the gospel. So to put it in context of church, we find joy with brothers and sisters in Christ who are pulling together to spread the gospel. I've found it over the years that the greatest fellowship I find with a group of students is when we're working together on a project on a mission trip. It doesn't matter how many games we've played together, how many fellowships we've had, how much food we've eaten together. Joy, in the sense that the Bible calls joy, comes when we are working together in the spreading of the gospel. But Paul goes on in verse 6 and he says that he also finds joy in confidence that God is going to to finish the work in these Christians at Philippi that he began when Paul began his ministry there. So it's working together, but also knowing I'm not quite finished yet, but I've got confidence that God is able to finish His work in me and also in all of us. So this morning we're going to pick up in verse 12 of chapter 1. So let's look at the scriptures together. Paul says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the Word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains." But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through, uh, through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had 
and now here that I still have. Now this morning, we're going to look at this, uh, this long passage of Scripture and we're going to try to see the highlights of it. In, in the past, when I've studied through this, I've broken this down into two or three sections and what I've discovered is that I kind of missed the theme of it all. You can focus in on the details and for me at least, I've missed some connections. Uh, I'm not going to take time to try to go into a lot of the things that I would like to say this morning because there's a baptism service scheduled at 11. But we're going to take some time to look at this. Now, I want to begin by asking a question. Where is it that you're supposed to serve Jesus? In working with college students, one of the big questions that are, that are asked uh, in the context of college is what am I going to major in? What am I going to do with that major? Well, some haven't looked that far yet. But if we put it into a faith question, we're saying, what does God want me to do with my life? By the way, I would say to you, that question doesn't end when you graduate from college. Because for a lot of people, that's a question that contends. Every time there's a transition of any kind in life, we have to re-ask the question, what does God want me to do with this life that He has given me? I've also noticed across a lot of years of ministry now, the most popular uh, major in BCM always has been, always will be undecided. It really is. And I would say to you that every student who has a major, it's up for change. I do remember trying to, in about November one year, trying to talk a senior out of, ch of changing a major. All of you parents who have had college students need to say thank you uh, because I think a degree in anything is better than no degree and you can go back and do something else, but get a degree so that you can go get a job. You know, it's a hard question. What does God want me to do? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith means I'm going to step out even though I don't know for sure. It's a, a posture of trust that God is able to see me through what this is. I want to be sure. But that's not faith. Faith says I'm going to take a step anyway. I'm going to trust God that He is leading me and that He will guide me in this step. But you know, life doesn't always take you in the direction that you think you are going. In the verses that begin the passage that we read for the first time in this letter, you find out that Paul is in prison. I don't think that's news to the Philippian church. I think they already know that Paul is there. But Paul is saying, we get too concerned about real estate, about where God wants me to serve. I want to say to you, the only place you can serve God is where you are. You're here this morning. If you're sitting right here, you can't serve God in Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, or Florida. You know why? You're sitting in a chair in this room. If you're going to serve God, it's got to start right where you are. And just because you find yourself in a situation you hadn't planned on, because things haven't turned out the way you had planned for them to turn out, doesn't mean that God made a mistake. Look at it real quick. In verses 12 to 13, Paul's in prison. I would add, again. If you look back to Acts 16, you'll find out Paul's ministry in Philippi started with going to jail. Paul could probably say, I've been in better jails than this one, and he wasn't being funny. He was being realistic. But jail didn't stop Paul. Have you read Nick Ripkin's The Insanity of God? If you like to read, you need to find a copy. It's a nonfiction book, but it reads better than a good novel. 
When I found it, I read it in a day. Now, Nick Ripkin is interviewing people who've gone through um, persecution, Christians going through persecution. In China, what they call seminary is when the pastors of the house, illegal house churches are discovered and they're sent off to prison for two or three years. That's what they call seminary. It's where their faith is tried. And you know what? Pastors have started churches and prisons. That's what Paul's doing here. He says that the gospel has not been hindered because I'm in jail. As a matter of fact, it's been advanced. That's in verse 12. In verse 13, Paul says, the palace guard and lots of other people have found out why I'm here. Why is he here? For preaching the gospel. They've heard it from Paul's own lips. And he says not only that, other believers have been encouraged to share the gospel because I'm in prison. I don't know what you're going through right now, but it's not a hindrance to the gospel. If we decide we're going to serve Jesus right where we are, your audience may have changed, but you still have the, the ability to share the gospel, to give praise to God no matter what your circumstances are, do you remember Paul and Silas thrown in that Philippian jail in the middle of the night? What are they doing? They're praying and singing hymns to God. That's what we're called to do. In the midst of whatever we face, we're called to praise God there. In verses 15 to 18, Paul says, yeah, some people have been encouraged to, to share. He says, you know what? Not all of them have Good motives. You know, not everybody was a friend of Paul or a supporter of Paul. Paul says one group has envy and rivalry. They have selfish ambition. They're, sense in, they're insincere and they're trying to stir up trouble. But he says they're preaching the gospel. Others, he said, have goodwill and they're doing it out of love and they're preaching the gospel. So Paul says... You know, not everybody's a fan, but it's okay. Have you ever been critical of somebody else's motive or their method for how they're doing evangelism? I know I'm not a fan of every method I've heard about, and yes, I'll admit I've been critical. But the question really needs to be turned around. Okay, if you don't like what they're doing, what are you doing? But if I've got time to criticize, it means I'm probably not doing much on the positive side. You know, in, in Cuba, where we go out and we do evangelism, we would show back up uh, for lunch and sit down and talk about sharing. One of the things that I have learned is that when we share the what we have been doing, there are two different reactions I will have. One is, mm, I don't think that fits me. But other times I'm looking or, uh, or listening to what people are saying and I'm saying, ooh, that's good. It's not criticism, but how can I take what somebody else is doing and put it into practice in my own life. Robbie Gallaty in Growing Up has a statement in the book, he's, or a question first and then a statement. He's, his question is, what's the best method of evangelism? The answer, the one you'll actually do. So instead of criticism, our, our real focus needs to be on what can we do to share the gospel. Paul says, I don't care if it's out of bad method uh, or bad motives or good motives. He said the important thing is the Bible's, uh, the, the gospel is going to be proclaimed. And even if it's from bad motives, if it's the true gospel, then people can still respond to Christ. They can still have their hearts touched and turn around. And Paul says that's what's important. If you'd underline anything in this chapter, 
in verse 18, Paul says, The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, this is what you need to underline or highlight, Christ is preached. And that's got to be our focus. The sharing of the gospel, where we are in whatever circumstance, Christ has to be preached. So in verses 20 uh, 20 to 26, I ask myself another question. What's the focus? What is my focus? Paul has kind of a little debate in this letter. He's in jail. One of the consequences of being imprisoned is that he could be executed. So Paul's saying, which is better, for me to live or me to die? One of the realities that we find in Scripture is that this is not our home. We are pilgrims passing through this life. Our eternal destination is to be with Christ in what the Bible calls heaven. We're going to be with Him. So Paul says, I kind of got a predicament here. Is it better for me to stay or is it better for me to go on and be with Christ? He says, I know it's better for you, the church, that I stay. He says, it'd be a whole lot better for me to just be finished with this life and be with Jesus forever. Paul had a brief vision of Jesus on on that uh, roadside one day, and now he wants to go and be with him uh, forever. But he says, you know, I, I know that it's necessary for me to remain with you because you need to keep growing, you need to keep maturing, and you need to have joy in your faith. And if I'm taken away, I know that it's going to be a discouragement to the churches. Paul says that I know that my presence with you, if I can be released and be back, it's going to make your joy overflow. It's not, at the end of this, Paul says, you know, it's really not about what I want. And this needs to be our focus as well. It's not what I want but it's what's going to help the church and further Christ's cause. Let's pause there just a minute and, and, and let that sink in. It's not about what I want. It's what's going to help my brothers and sisters in Christ and what's going to help the gospel go forward. And it's in that context, verse 21, Paul says, but for... To me, uh, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is saying, let Jesus be exalted in my life or in my death. That's what's important, that Christ is lifted up. Then in verses 27 to 30, I ask a third question. How will you live? Paul starts out by saying, you and I are to live in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. Now, as I started trying to look to Scripture to define that, because I know that left to our own selves, we'll define it out of our own cultural context. You know, we'll say, well, I go to church every time the doors open, I'm doing this, 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 and this, and that defines what a good Christian is. And so that's to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. But let's look at what Paul says in the letter. In verse 27, he says that we're to stand firm in one spirit. We're contend as one for the faith. And in verse 28, we're not to fear those who oppose us. So, If we look at those things, we're to be united and we're to be fearless. I haven't done this research for myself, so I'm trusting that whoever did it is right. But I've read that there are 366 places in the Bible that we are told either to fear not or to not be afraid. And the person writing said that's one for every day of the year, even in a leap year. We are not to live in a spirit of fear. 
As a matter of fact, we can live in a spirit that is fearless. Not because there aren't some scary things in life. But we can live fearlessly because of the one who gives us a hope, whether in life or in death. In suffering or in conflict, we can see the big picture and we can live in a way that is counter to our cultural beliefs. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. And if I'm going to live in a manner that is worthy of the gospel, that's what I'm going to keep in focus. So let me wrap this up if I could today. When we are living in the difficult times, our lives can be transformed into a joyful, Christ-honoring situation. But I'd say you can't wait till the times get tough to find that. You've got to live that way even when they're not. But if we're going to do that, we've got to focus on that uh, in our own lives, in our own selves, that we are involved in sharing the gospel. I'm not saying all of you need to be called to preach because the pastor is the one who leads the church to do the ministry. Do we realize that as members of a church, you are a better evangelist than your pastor can be? You know why? You pay your preacher to do it. When a member of a church shares, it's out of concern and love. We are focusing on sharing the gospel. We are focused on Christ being exalted in me. We are focusing on living for Christ today. We are focused on finding joy and living joy in Christ. And so that our lives are lived in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. In the next chapter, you're going to read uh, that Paul's focus is that I want to know Christ. You know what? That's the basis for all of this. A daily, close, personal relationship with Jesus. That's what I would invite you to today. To know Jesus to love Him, to give your whole life to Him so that He can be honored in you. Let's pray. Thank You, Lord, for loving us so much. Thanking, thank You for calling us to a joyful relationship with You. And as Your followers, our heart's desire is to live a life that is worthy of You. So today, help us to recommit ourselves to that end. And I pray today, Father, if there's someone here who's never given their life to Jesus, that they would come to that relationship with you today to repent of their sins, to trust in you, and to commit their lives to follow you. As we come to a time of response, I pray that your spirit will move and that we will respond as you lead. Amen.